10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our special live stream today for International Women's Day. Today, we are celebrating amazing women in STEAM, which is science, technology, engineering, art and design, and math. My name is Nicole, and I'll be the host for today's event. I would like to begin by gratefully acknowledging that Science World is located on the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil -Waututh peoples. Now, here at Science World, we also have STEAM careers where we focus on education and sparking wonder and curiosity in these STEAM fields. We're gonna pop over to Noor at center stage just to show you what this looks like for us. All right, hi, hi. my name is Noor. Welcome to Science World. I'm a part-time facilitator here at Science World. And today I'm gonna to show you how to make fireballs. First, let me get my goggles on and let me get my things over here. So we need three things to make a fireball. First of all, we need oxygen, which we've got in abundance all around us. We need some fuel, which is like a podium powder today. And we need a heat source, which I've got right here in my little lighter. So we're gonna put all these things together. I'm gonna fill my little tube here with some fuel and podium powder. There we go. Get a good amount to make a nice, decent fireball for all of you today. All right, put that over there. And let's get ready, okay? I'm going to light up my lighter and I'm gonna count down from three. All right, three, two, one. All right. <laughs> Exciting, yes, that was a nice big fireball. Awesome. All right. Well, Wonderful, thank well, thank you, Noor. Of course. <laughs> Excellent. So today we are also going to meet three incredible STEAM mentors from all over the province who work in a wide variety of fields. We would also like to thank Acuitas Therapeutics and BCIT for their generous support of these events. Our technician, Larry, will be monitoring the chat today. So if you have any technical issues, pop your questions in that chat and they'd be happy to assist. Please feel free to share any questions or your reactions to the demonstrations and activities. There will also be a chance at the end to ask questions to our wonderful mentors. We ask that you keep comments in the chat respectful and relevant to the topics being discussed. And remember, do not share any personal information online. If you would like to try out the chat, we would love to hear where you're joining us from and how many people are watching at your location. <clears throat> well, as we are entering our locations in the chat, let's talk about our first presenter, Pearl. Now, Pearl Lowe is a non-binary story artist, comics artist, author, and muralist. They work in animation for TV and film and has worked on projects such as Hair Love, Canvas, and Craig of the Creek. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the show, Pearl. Hi there, good morning. Super excited to be here today. I am really looking forward to sharing you guys, uh, sharing with you guys a little bit about the process of storyboarding. I think a lot of people want to get into animation, but they don't realize the different components that go into the pipeline of creating cartoons. And so um, I will be sharing with you, hopefully you can see my script right here. When we get an episode to start um, at any studio, I'm gonna be showing some work from uh, Craig of the Creek um, and they were at Cartoon Network. So I'm gonna be sharing some Cartoon Network stuff with you. Uh, the very first thing that you need is a script and that's your story, right? And so here's a script of an episode that has already aired. Um, it's called Galactic Goodbyes. And it was a story written by many, many people on the team, including myself. And I wanna show you the very kind of beginning scene where we are looking at two characters, Craig and Sparkle Cadet, my favorite magical girl character. And they are just chatting it up in their secret hideout in the stump in the creek. And so here's some character sheets that I want to share with you as well. Before I can start drawing, I have to have some designs to talk about or to be able to like draw um the characters properly to scale um, to make sure that I don't forget any details with them. So this is Craig. This is our main character right here. And this is called a turnaround sheet. So there are different um, angles of Craig um, as he turns around in space. So I know what he looks like from all angles. 
And then we have Sparkle Cadet, which is my favorite magical girl character. And we also have some turnaround poses um, for her. So I know what she looks like from front to back. And once I have that, I open up a program called Storyboard Pro. Now there are a lot of different types of programs um, that people use in animation to create storyboards. I think the most common are two which is Photoshop, which I think a lot of you guys may have heard. And then uh, Storyboard Pro, which is um, a Toon Boom pro, um, program. And so Storyboard Pro allows you to have all these different frames down here. And what, you, what happens is that um, each frame is a drawing. And so when I start an episode, I like to write the title of the episode. So Galactic Goodbyes is my first frame. <laughs> and I'll walk you through some of the drawings that I've already done. Um, and we'll pitch you what it's like um, to go through an episode. And so you start off at a background. And in 2D animation, a lot of the backgrounds are already drawn. And right here, what you're seeing is your camera. And when you actually click off, um, see if you can see the camera there. But when you actually click out of this frame, this whole background is actually a drawing, but I only want you to see a specific part. So I make sure that the camera is cropped into this background specifically for a certain type of shot. And so we start off at Craig in the stump at the creek and Craig goes, can you believe this? Sparkle Cadet says, what? I didn't know there was a pink lake in the creek. That's not a lake, Sparkle Cadet. Jessica spilled her juice on my map. Emotional. I can't look at it. Now I gotta redraw the whole thing. Aw, oh, that sounds like it's gonna take a while. Hmm. I think I know what'll cheer you up. You're gonna put nail polish on my map now? No, on your nails. Sometimes looking fabulous is the first step to feeling fabulous. Shing. And on the background there. You see this glowing, sparkling nail polish. She grabs one, goes super sparkle blast. Craig is like, wait, what? Is this an attack? Oh. oh, this is incredible. As he looks at his nails. I can't even remember why I was upset. Sparkle Cadet goes, told ya. Oh, pick something else for your other hand. He goes, okay. And then let's, and I wanted to show you how I also clean up a drawing in storyboards because when we create boards for um, storyboards for Craig of the Creek specifically, we go through three rounds. We go through like a thumbnail round, which is kind of like how you're seeing this drawing right now. It's a little sketchy and it's not like super detailed. And then we go through a second round to do revisions, talk to the directors, the supervisors to get feedback on what we've drawn. And then the last step, which is what I'm gonna show you right now is basically just doing a cleanup sketch and what I like to do is turn off the background so I can see Craig fully. And this is what he looks like. He's, a little, he's cropped off, but I don't need to draw him all the way just because the camera field is only seeing this part of him. So what I like to do is lower the opacity of the drawing, create a new layer. Maybe I'll call it Craig. And then I'll start drawing with, um, with black so you can see. And so what I'll usually start doing is the eyes as it helps me anchor um, the face. Also, sorry if you hear like the garbage truck, I guess it's garbage day. No garbage truck sounds here. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> and so when I draw the eyes, I'm able to figure out, okay, if the eyes are here, the nose goes here. If his nose is here, then his mouth goes here. and I'm able to figure out placement a lot easier. And everyone draws differently um, just because everyone's way of thinking is different. So, but that works for me. So I'm doing his neck and his little, what do you call it? Um, sweater, if I can zoom out, oh, maybe. Okay, well, I put away the designs, but um, in his design, he has a sweater. And I think in this episode, we were talking about, oh, Craig doesn't need his bag right now. Um, he has a purse that he carries around that his mom gave him. And sometimes he brings it along, but since he's inside, I won't draw him having a purse. So. 
<laughs> and so I'm just curious, are you on a tablet right now? How are you drawing this? Yeah, so one of the industry standards, not that everyone uses it, but um, I'm using a Wacom Wacom Cintiq. And it's a really big 22 inch monitor that basically just looks like a regular like uh, computer screen, but I can draw on it, which is really useful. Um, and I like it because it's easier to use for me than a little tablet that you, um, what do you call it? That you plug in via USB because um, there's more surface area. Like I'm, I'm literally drawing like around my screen. So I really enjoy that personally. Awesome. Some people some people like tablets because they can draw like kind of more um, in a more tight more like space, paper, but kind of, yeah. yeah, yeah. But I really enjoy drawing on a Cintiq. And so here's my drawing of Craig. And to make sure that the background does not show through, we also have something called a matte layer, which is just basically a white, um, painted filled in layer. And so what I do is I just trace over the outlines right here and then I just fill it. And then he's right there visible. And so as I continue, you have Craig continuing to say, okay, let's use this one. And then it echoes this one, 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 one. Sparkle Cadet, Sparks, huh? You all right? Oh, sorry, Craig. I accidentally space time traveled. The color reminds me of somebody I used to know a long, long time ago. Wow, I'd love to hear that while you work on this hand. Before we landed here in Herkleton, my family moved around the galaxy a lot. She twists the bottle open, and that's the end of that scene. Very, so, yeah. very cool. That is my little demonstration. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. It's really awesome to be able to just peek into the tools that you use in your industry and see how you actively engage with those tools and just the whole process as well. It's neat too, to see such like a little clip spread out over all of these different frames, right? It's awesome to yes. get this behind the scenes look. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Wonderful. So we are going to bring our mentors back up at the end of the show for a Q&A. So get your questions ready. And before I bring up our next mentor, I do want to do just a few quick shout outs. It looks like we've got people joining us all the way from Squamish. We've got some students out in North Vancouver, Vancouver, even all the way out to Vancouver Island. So thank you, everyone. It's wonderful to see you here today. All right, so our next mentor we are going to bring up is Paulina Blagojevich. Now, she's a research scientist at Acuitas Therapeutics, and as a synthetic chemist, she creates and makes parts for molecular ambulances that drive tiny molecules into the cells in need. So a warm welcome to Paulina. Hello. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm super excited to share what I'm doing in the lab with you. Excellent. So, uh, as you heard, I am a synthetic chemist and believe it or not, I'm making parts for really small, heavy duty cars. And uh, I'm going to show you now, first I'm going to tell you why we do need such a tiny, weeny small cars, uh, how small they are, uh, what they are made of, and uh, I will show you them in action. So, what does start with up? like regular human body. As you know, we are composed of different organs and uh, all those organs are composed of different cells. And in order for us to feel really good and be healthy, uh, everything should be in order. But the problem is, you know, we are always under some kind of attack of like different kind of bugs want to get inside and uh, we need to fight back. And we do have immune system that help us with that. But um, unfortunately, sometimes our immune system is not really good enough to fight back. And you all know about COVID and how much trouble that brought to us. And all that was caused by a tiny little, uh, little bag called the virus. So uh, as in the case of COVID, we needed external help. We needed something to help our cells to defend. And there is a really nice molecule called mRNA. And it, that molecule was uh, really helpful for us fighting uh, COVID. But in order to get that molecule inside ourselves and to help us, 
we needed something magical because that molecule cannot just enter our body and go where it needs to be. So uh, again, uh, we have this uh, mRNA molecule and I will call it a doctor molecule because that was it was. It had a recipe for our bodies how to fight back that nasty little bug. And that doctor molecule needed to enter our cells. And in this case, you can think of our cells as if it's a home and it's a home that has a patient inside and our doctor needs to get inside the home, get to the uh, patient's bedside and give him uh, 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 instructions how to fight back the bugs. So we needed a car. We needed a car that will bring our doctor into the house and help the patient. But you know what? Uh, that car needed to be super resilient and super uh, heavy duty because, you know, our body is meant to fight back everything that comes inside. So you can think uh, about our doctor and our small vehicle as if they had to go through really terrifying forest full of terrors, full of like crazy, dangerous animals, maybe even in a fire. So this small little car has to be super strong and super specific. But it's also really super tiny. And I will show you right now. And I, I want you to get the sense how tiny it is. So uh, imagine having a small ball that has diameter of one centimeter. And I kind of have it now here. I hope you can see it. And you can see it on the screen. And imagine like dividing this small ball into 10 different pieces. So you will get something that has diameter of one millimeter. And you can try doing that. And you will see that you will end up with something super small, I have it here. I don't even think you will be able to see it. It's on top, like top of my finger. Uh, but imagine like small car that are not actually this big or this big that would be like similar to one centimeter or this big that will be similar to one millimeter. It has to be million times smaller than this one centimeter car because that's the, that's the, um, say size of our small little car and I forgot to tell you their name are LMPs that car is called LNP so you know it's really not easy to make something that small and even more so it's not uh, just made it, it's not just one small ball it's actually something quite complex and what you can see now on screen rotating is actually something that is the main component of uh, our small little car and that's called lipid and LNP stands for lipid nanoparticle lipid because it's made of lipids and this is what you can see on the screen the more it's the most famous lipid that was used to make the most famous lipid nanoparticle in the world I think and that lipid nanoparticle was used in COVID vaccine and it enabled a, a super doctor molecule to get into our cells and to give us a recipe how to fight COVID. So the good things and a really nice thing is that this uh, specific molecule is actually was actually invented here in Vancouver in the lab I'm working in and I know the guy who invented it and I can tell you that whoever got the Pfizer shot uh, he had these small little cars driving through his body. And that, I think it's super cool. So what I'm doing as a chemist, I'm actually making those lipids. That's my job. Every day at work, I come to work and I play with Lego bricks in a way. I hope you remember that that molecule that was spinning, it has, it, it's comprised of a lot of small different balls. And those balls are atoms and chemists combine different atoms to make different molecules. So basically I take Lego bricks and I combine them in different ways. And that's how I make uh, a lot of different lipids that are used to make a lot of different uh, lipid nanoparticles or like small so heavy duty vehicles. And you might ask, why do we need so many of them? Maybe we have this super nice molecule I showed you and it's a star and it works. Well, you know, uh, similarly as you want to have uh, different cars, uh, maybe you like different colors, maybe when you want different speeds, we need different types of LMPs to be able to deliver different types of doctors to different types of cells. And we want to do that in the most safe way possible, uh, as fast as possible. Uh, and uh, that's why we need chemists to invent new lipids. And so far, for example, in our lab, there was 
almost 1000 different lipids that were invented and they were used to make even more different LMP small cars. So now I'll show you how they actually work and uh, bear with here with me. You will see a really nice video. So here this, well, you can think of this as small doors to uh, a house. So this inside here is a cell. So this is my small vehicle. This is how that LNP looks like. This inside is a doctor molecule. And you see this tiny little whitish lines. So those are lipids. Those are, those are small lipids we are making and we assemble them and we make the small car and then off it goes and it will enter the cell. So this is our vehicle entering the cell. The doctor comes out. This is our patient. And you will now see how doctor goes to the patient and it will deliver the recipe. The red is uh, um, like medication. And now we are good to fight all nasty little bugs that want to attack our body and uh, make us feel sick. And hopefully we will not. So that's what vaccines were doing. And I can tell you, I uh, LMPs are help, like help saving the world because uh, if not the LMPs, uh, then no vaccines at, uh, for COVID, for example. So if you know anyone who got the shot, you know someone who is having these like small cars driving to their body. So that's what I wanted to share with you. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Paulina. It's a very wonderful way to think about the way that we are helping ourselves. And I like this vision of the little ambulance driving in and bringing the doctor to help me out and help my body fight these things. So it's a fantastic way to start to build understanding of how these things are working for us. And I had no idea that these are these lipids are just something that's invented and that you know the people that invent them and you're building them yourself. I think that's absolutely fantastic and fascinating. Yeah, and we are learning from nature. I think that every one of you heard about lipids. You know, like we, we are taking lipids with our diet. Uh, our food contains a lot mm -hmm. of lipids. These lipids are a little bit different, but they are in a way inspired with, but, uh, by what we do have in our organism. And uh, the good thing uh, is that you can, you know, be very creative when you make them. And it's super fun. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Yep. And just a reminder to everyone, we will see Paulina again in our Q&A at the end. So if you have any of those questions, you can pop them in the chat and we will get to those later on. Amazing. Thanks, Paulina. Thank you. So finally, our last mentor we're going to chat with today is Yuna Kim. Now, Yuna Kim is a field operations planner for the Broughton Aquaculture Transition Initiative. So she works on the conservation of wild salmon in Broughton Archipelago in the territories of the Numgis, the Mamalilikula, and the Kwikwasudinuk Hawamics First Nations. So welcome, Yuna. Hi, everyone. I'm so Ooh. excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me and happy Women's Day. <laughs> Um, I have a little slideshow ready for you guys, just explaining some of the work we do here. So yeah, like Nicole already said, my name's Yuna. I work for the Brown and Aquaculture Transition Initiative, and we call it Batty. And I am the field operations planner, meaning that I plan a lot of field work that we do. I make sure that the right trucks go out to where they need to be, the right boats go where they need to be, take care of all the gear, and I make sure that everyone knows exactly what they are doing that day. Um, so there are three nations that are a part of Batty, um, and their territories are in the Broughton Archipelago and areas that are now known as Port McNeil and Was. Um, the next slide has a map that I wanted to show you guys. Um, has anyone ever been to the north end of Vancouver Island? There is a star at the very bottom, and that's where Vancouver is located, where Science World is. And I work where the star at the star there's at the top of the page in Alert Bay, and that is where our office is. Ooh, and we do this have some joining us from Vancouver Island. I'm not sure whereabouts, but maybe they're more familiar with where you are than I am for sure. Yeah, so this is a close up of the Broughton Archipelago. This is where we do most of our work. And does anybody here know what an archipelago is? 
and archipelago is a cluster of islands. So like you can see in this map, there's lots of little islands and this is what makes up the Broughton Archipelago. And what kind of work do we do here at Batty? We are here to protect wild Pacific salmon. We particularly want to study the effects of open net fish farms and also restoring wild salmon habitat. And why do we want to protect salmon? Why are salmon so important to us? Um, salmon is important for food, culture, jobs, and the natural ecosystem. So here's a picture of salmon that I ate. It was cooked over an open fire. There's nothing special on it, just salmon. And we ate it with their hands. It was so delicious. Also, salmon is very important, is a very important part of the culture for lots of indigenous communities. There's actually stories about salmon berries. These are, this is a picture of salmon berries that me and my friend picked last summer. And people thought if there were lots of salmon berries, there'd be a good salmon harvest as well. So last year we picked a lot of salmon berries. So, and there were also lots of salmon. So that was very exciting. Also, another reason why salmon is so important is for jobs. Lots of people here on the north end of the island and Vancouver as well are commercial fishers. There's also lots of fishing lodges and people that come up here to recreationally fish. Salmon is also a very important part of the natural ecosystem. Salmon are born in rivers and then they go back to the ocean to live and they come back to the rivers to spawn and their bodies, they die there, their bodies decompose and they add a lot of nutrients to our waters. And also has anyone here ever seen an orca whale before? Orca whales eat salmon. So yeah, they're just generally a very important part of the ecosystem here in the oceans. So we were looking at some of the effects that open net fish farms have on our wild salmon. Um, in open net fish farms, sometimes there are different pests and diseases that can attack them and they can affect our wild salmon as well. So we wanna study that and see what's happening there. But today I want to talk about one of my favorite things to do at work and that is snorkel surveys. Um, so snorkel surveys, as you can see, everyone here is wearing a dry suit. You can wear a dry suit or a wetsuit. I like to wear a dry suit because I get really cold in the water. So a dry suit is really tight. It's really tight around your neck, around your feet, or, and around your wrists as well. So no water can get in. Your clothes stay 100% dry. And you stick, you, well, you have to wear a hood, which I have here today. I'm going to show you guys. You can laugh. It's going to look really funny. <laughs> <laughs> but I wear a hood so that my hair can stay a little bit dry and my head can stay warm as well. And only, oh, my, <laughs> only my face sticks out. I have gloves to keep my hands warm as well. I wear a mask. I'm going to put it on. And also, I have my snorkel. This goes in my mouth and I don't breathe through my nose. I only breathe through my mouth. And this stays on top of the, like out of the water. So you can stick your face in and you can breathe through your mouth and you don't have to lift your head up. You can just look around and keep breathing. It's really, really handy. Awesome. <laughs> so when we do, when we do circle surveys, <laughs> We count the number of fish in the water, what kind of species are in there, um, and we check for the water temperature, what the water levels are, and just anything else that we see while we're snorkeling. Um, I have a quick little video I wanted to show you guys. So whoever is snorkeling will carry a GoPro, and they'll just hold it underwater, point it down, and record the fish swimming by. Because sometimes it's really hard to count them all. As you can see, there's lots of fish and it's really hard to count. So sometimes it's nice to have a video that you can look back on. And yeah. So while you're recording this, you're still counting, but then you can go back and kind of compare your totals to your recording afterwards. 
Yeah, and sometimes it's just hard to tell what the different species are. So it's good to have videos. It really helps later to make sure that your numbers and species are right. That's so cool. Yeah, so pretty fun. So yeah, that's one of my favorite things to do here at Batty. <laughs> Um, there's lots of other people on my team. Some people drive boats, some people fly drones, some people study the rivers, the kelp, and collect traditional knowledge so we know what was in these waters in the past. Um, so yeah, if you feel passionate about nature, this is something that you could do one day in the future as well. And I hope this inspired someone today. Yay, thank you so much, Yuna. That is so excellent to see. And I love that you get to just get right in the water for your work and you get to be right there in nature. And I think that's a fantastic way to really explore that passion about nature and really kind of contribute to the cultures in the area as well and use and access their knowledge. I think that's fantastic. Thank you so, so much. All right, so now it is time for our Q&A. So we're gonna bring all of our mentors back and we have some time for any questions that you at home or at school in the audience might have for Pearl, Paulina, or Yuna, please feel free to type those in the chat and we can discuss them now. So while we're waiting for any of those questions to pop in, I would love to hear, maybe we could kind of go around and just chat a little bit about maybe how you kind of got into this career. What was it? What was that moment where you were like, yes, this is my STEAM career moment that I'm going to pursue? Um, if anybody wants to volunteer to answer right away, feel free, or I'm just going to pick on us all. Oh, well, you and I saw your smile first, so you get to answer first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was, I actually remember the moment really clearly. I think I was in grade seven. I had a teacher show me a video about the natural world and some of the things that were happening, pollution, climate change, and it immediately inspired me to take care of the planet. And I knew that the planet needed our help. So yeah, I always knew I wanted to go that route. And I also love animals. So this is the perfect combination for me. Awesome, thank you. Okay, we're gonna go in like a, a clockwise direction. Pearl, what was your moment? I think it was also really early for me wanting to go into animation because I, I was very much a TV watcher as a kid and seeing all these different cartoons was really inspiring. And one day, I guess I thought about how cartoons made me feel and how I wanted to give that feeling to somebody else in the future and how I could do that was to be part of the teams that make animation. And obviously, I didn't articulate that at a young age, but I think towards like the beginning of high school, I was like, oh my gosh, I think like real people make cartoons. Like that's a real job. So I started practicing drawing a lot more in high school and in university, I studied it um, at Capilano University. I studied the animation and I didn't actually want to go into storyboarding at first because I wanted to. I went into storyboarding because I was like, I have, this is something I suck the least at. I will specialize in storyboarding. I will try this. And then I got into it and I, I've loved it ever since. Oh, amazing. That sounds great. Thanks, Pearl. All right, Paulina, what was your moment? Why I don't, I, I'm not sure that I can pinpoint the moment, you know, I, as long as I know, I was always really drawn to puzzles and, uh, uh, you know, and at the beginning, I, I really wanted to be a mathematician. And then I discovered computer programming and I wanted to be that. And then I got this uh, uh, project in, in high school and I had really good uh, chemistry teacher and uh, it was it. I figure out that I can combine my love for math, my uh, love for problem solving, and there's always a little bit of a magic related to chemistry, you know? There's a, a little bit of witchcraft there, and I love that part too, <laughs> so. Awesome, that sounds fantastic. Thank you. All right, looks like we have some questions coming in from the chat. So, um, ooh, there are probably both for Yuna. First off, how do you know you're not counting the same fish more than once? This comes from Carrie out in Squamish. It is really hard sometimes to make sure you're not counting the same fish more than once. Um, we are usually in the rivers 
and we have a team of three, four, five people in. So sometimes, you know, I'll take one side, my partner will take the other side, there'll be someone in the middle, there's usually someone walking as well, just to look out for bears and other things, rapids coming up. <laughs> so usually I just try to focus on my section and we do have to sometimes estimate a little bit. They're swimming really fast as well. So it's hard to get an exact number all the time. It's always hard to get perfect data, right? Data collection in itself, that process. There's always a little bit of estimation for sure. Yes, for <laughs> sure. Um, all right. Now we also have from Jenny wondering how long you stay in the water for while you're doing research and what's the coolest creature that you've ever seen? It really depends on what we're doing, but for most of our snorkel surveys, it, it also depends on how long the river is. Um, there's one area that we swim all the time, Kakuikin River, and sometimes it takes up to four hours to swim it from the beginning to the end, the section that we want to study at least. Um, but we take lots of breaks because four hours is a very long time to swim. <laughs> and the coolest creature ever, I love whales. They're so cool. They never get boring. They're so big. I think they're my favorite. Awesome. Um, so now we have a question for Pearl from Bruce, wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about the process to color your animations. Yeah, so in storyboarding, uh, in the pipeline of animation in general, storyboarding is at the very beginning of the process. And so we usually deal with um, scripts and we deal with like obviously like the storyboard uh, aspect of the um, camera work for the uh, episode or film we're working on. So we don't specifically work um, with color. Sometimes if there's like an action scene and there are a lot of moving parts, a lot of different characters and a lot of different effects, like grounds are break, like the ground is breaking and there's like fire and everything. Sometimes we'll color um, the different effects, different colors. So when you watch uh, a put together animatic, which is all the uh, storyboards put side by side and timed out by the editor, there's music added, whatever. It's kind of like your pre, like your little like first look at the actual animated product. Um, sometimes coloring different like parts of the storyboard helps. Um, the viewer distinguish what's going on instead of looking at everything that's black and white. Um, but in general, coloring usually happens uh, at a later stage. Um, sometimes it happens in the design stage with the characters and then the animators take those characters that are already colored and they, you know, move them, pose them around. Um, but for storyboarding purposes, like color isn't a huge part, but maybe we'll do it for the sake of clarity. Awesome, thank you. All right, question for Paulina. What made you feel that your job was the best fit for you? This comes from Michelle. Well, you know, uh, I've been in science for like 15 years now, something like that. And I've been through different disciplines in chemistry. I was a natural product chemistry, then I became a synthetic chemist like some five years ago. And there wasn't a single day uh, that I came to job, no matter at which institution it was, which part of chemistry I was exploring, that I was bored and I didn't want to be here. So I think that, that, that that's a, you know, a fantastic indicator that it's really a good fit for me. I always find something that's interesting and it, it, it's really a puzzle solving thing. Uh, and I, it, it has more of a sense of a game and playing than a, a job an obligation and something that you have to do, but you really don't want to. So I think that that was from the day, day one, I had that feeling, uh, everything that, that, that is related to chemistry and the lab uh, is like that for me. I love that. I don't think I ever would have associated working in chemistry as a game. Like I love that that can be a part of the aspect and why it's such a good fit for you. I love that. Thank you. Um, so we've got some students at Thunderbird wondering, uh, Yuna, how long do you stay underwater when you're doing the surveys? Ooh, good question. I like to look up a lot because <laughs> I want to make sure I'm not running into logs or rapids or that there's no bears in front of me. So I usually just stay in for a few minutes at a time. I'll put my head in with my snorkel and I'll take a break, look up a little, go back under. <laughs> awesome. 
Ooh, okay, back to Paulina. We are hearing from more students uh, in Carrie's class. What happens if the LNP doesn't work or if it fails? Well, our job is to uh, Im invent things that will work. So, uh, of course, like as in any uh, type of investigation any type of science you have experiments that are successful you have experiments that are not and if something doesn't work you go back to that, that uh, those results also because they are valuable they will give you insight of what should be changed you know sometimes uh, I make a lipid that will not be able to make a lipid nanoparticle you know so uh, you learn both from successful experiments and those that are not successful and you re redesign you reinvent you change so that's why we say we are designing lipids and lipid nanoparticles and we are just making them work so it's it's back and forth process uh, and there is something called SAR it's structure activity relationship so we learn from what we got and there is a lot of different tests that uh, show us if the something will be successful or not and only when we are sure that something will work and that it will be safe we uh, forward that to uh, later stages of research and maybe we will tested in, in, in more complex models, and eventually we will use it um, for medications, you know. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so let's go for a question for Pearl, wondering from one of the students in Bruce's class, how long does the process take to create a finished animation, start to finish? What does that look like? How long is that? Yeah, I guess it, I guess it depends on what kind of form uh, you're making. For a feature film, a lot of times, say like a Disney Pixar film, those take four years to complete. And the first two years is a lot of like going back and forth, rewriting script, doing storyboards, seeing what works and if what doesn't work needs to get rewritten, re-storyboarded, things get redesigned. Um, so a feel, yeah, a feature film can take up to four years, sometimes longer, depending on like how much time and how much money you're given. If you're given a lot of money, you can take all the time that you want. <laughs> but if you have a smaller budget, usually things happen quicker on the TV side of things. So hmm, a lot of times when I do a storyboard for an episode, I won't see it air until like a year later. So I think it could take up to a year for your first episode, which is like for me, like an 11 minute episode on Craig of the Creek to be completed and aired on television. Wow, I really take animation for granted when you're like, okay, when's the next episode coming yes. up? Yes. <laughs> very long process. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Um, question for Yuna, student question again. Um, what are the impacts of marine pollution on salmon? What are some things that you've noticed? What can you tell us? Ooh, these are really good questions, guys. <laughs> um, so yeah, marine pollution can affect salmon and pretty much all the other animals and wildlife in the waters and the oceans. Um, let's say, for example, like pieces of plastic, microplastics that are really small, salmon could potentially eat those and it would harm their insides. Just same for us if we ate a piece of plastic it would not be good for us. <laughs> so yeah, that's something that we have to be really careful of. Interesting. Ooh, okay, Paulina, have you studied in any other places in the world? Wondering from Bruce's class here. Oh, well, I, 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 I am sure that you can tell from my language that I'm not a native English speaker. Uh, so definitely, I didn't study in Canada. I moved to Canada some five years ago, and I'm originally from Serbia, and I studied there, and I spent after that uh, some time in Germany, and I had a research, say, in France. So I did, uh, like, studied in a way I, I attended university or I uh, studied in the lab by actually doing something uh, during my research stays in several countries, yes. And I think it's really important for any who wants to uh, do science to uh, uh, get as much experience and knowledge from different locations and places because you can always learn something new somewhere else. So yeah, I did. I love that. And I love to think that like STEAM is the universal language, right? It's something it that is. you can it access is. in different places, kind of on that same level. I love that. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, another question from Thunderbird, our students out here for 
Pearl, um, what characters or anime characters have inspired you to make Craig? And a shout out, thank you for your presentation. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like, so it's interesting. Every artist, when they're on a production, brings their lived experience to the story. So for my, for, for me working on Craig, I feel like I bring a lot of like my own lived experience. For Sparkle Cadet, uh, for example, because she's a magical girl character, I feel like Carcaptor Sakura and like Sailor Moon are two characters that come to mind when I think about drawing her. Um, and it's really cool too, because like, well, not cool in the sense that this is one of the first black magical girls I've worked with, but I'm happy that I'm able to make, like bring that experience of watching Carcaptor Sakura and watching Sailor Moon and being like, okay, but how is this expressed now as Sparkle Cadet? Um, and how can I bring that to the show in general on Craig of the Creek? I think even with, um, like fight scenes that would happen in Craig of the Creek, I would uh, often try to add a sprinkle of like, okay, this is what like a magical girl would do. I don't care if Craig is a boy, I'm gonna do it anyway. <laughs> He's gonna fight like this. So I feel like I, I try to put that in every episode that I do, at least just a little bit. Awesome, I love that. Um, da -da -da -da. Maybe we will, ooh, okay, back to Yuna. What happens if your video camera, your GoPro isn't working when you're counting this salmon? How is that gonna affect your process, your results? <laughs> you know what, it's, it's okay if it doesn't work. We have lots of people looking at it as well and all the, all the people that we work in the field are experts. So they're pretty good at counting and identifying the salmon in the waters. So it's really nice to have the cameras, but if we don't, it's totally okay for us. Excellent. Well, unfortunately, that is all of the time that we have today. But thank you so much for this very rich and exciting Q&A session for all of your presentations. Again, this was very wonderful, informative. And I love that we got a little peek into a wide variety of STEAM industries today. So we do want to just take a moment again and once again, thank Acuitas and BCIT for their generous support of these events. Now, if you'd be interested in seeing any parts of this program again, the stream will stay active with the recording, so you can access it with the same link that you used to join us today. For information about other Girls and STEAM events, please visit scienceworld.ca slash today slash events. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope that you all stay curious.